Greetings to you all, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. For those of you tuning in for the first time, if you begin to like what you are hearing, please hit the subscribe button and join the family. Don't forget to set that bell to all. That way you'll be reminded of every time I upload a video, which tends to be two to four times a week. If you'd like to learn how to become a member, all of that information can be found down below. Without further ado, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person every day. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Disturbing Ghost Stories. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. I'll read the first story, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. I have a lot of ghost stories. I grew up in a neighborhood deep in the woods in an area full of cults and forgotten graveyards. When I was eight, there was a series of thunderstorms that caused our electricity to go out for a few days. Every night, the lightning and thunder and the wind howling would terrify me, and I would go running, crying to my parents' room and begging them to let me sleep in their room. One night, I woke up to a lady's voice calling my name. I sat up, realizing I could hear thunder again and thinking my mom has come to get me. Instead, the warm glow of a soft candlelight flickered on the walls of my room. A beautiful woman stood in my doorway. She was wearing an old-fashioned white nightgown that looked to be from the early 1900s and was holding a candle with one hand cupped protectively around the flame to keep the wind from blowing it out. She had long, curly, dark hair, deep brown eyes, and looked to be of Native American descent. At first, I thought it was my mom wearing strange clothes, but then she called my name again, and I realized this was not my mother's voice. Are you afraid of the thunder? She asked. I was not afraid. Although she was a stranger, her presence was soothing. But at that moment, the thunder roared and I was scared again. Don't be afraid, she told me, smiling at me. There's nothing to be afraid of. Lightning flashed and I woke suddenly from the dream and found myself sitting upright. My mom was standing in the darkness where the lady had stood. Get up. I've been calling your name for the last five minutes. You can sleep in my room. Where is the lady? I asked, wondering if I was still in a dream. It had felt so real. What lady, sweetie? The lady in white. My mom only stared at me for a moment, then turned and went back to her room. I haven't mentioned the lady who visited me to anyone since, but I have always wondered who she was. Was she an angel or a ghost, a dream or a vision? I guess I will never know. This began such a long time ago that I can't remember everything perfectly. I think the first time I saw her was at around six years old by a river. I was with my cousin, who's around the same age as me, and as we were walking, I saw this teenage girl skipping down the path wearing headphones. She was lip syncing pretty aggressively like making hand movements to whatever song she was listening to and really enunciating every word. I thought it was weird and it kind of stuck with me because of how much she stood out. But I probably forgot about it the next day. The next time I saw her was at our local mall, probably about a year later. She looked the exact same as she did the first time I saw her and was doing the exact same thing. 
skipping whilst aggressively lip-syncing to the music she was playing through her headphones. I didn't think much of it. I told myself she was probably some girl that lived in the area, which would explain why I was seeing her for the second time. Then, a few years later, I see her in a different city my family and I drove to during some break. We are walking around with a few of our other relatives when I see the exact same girl doing the exact same thing. She looks the exact same. She hasn't aged one bit. She's wearing the same headphones and the same hairdo. I've never focused on her clothes before, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was the exact same outfit. It was questionable, but I never felt the need to tell anyone about it. I had seen her for a few more times after that, but I won't go into detail since it's basically the same idea. I'll be doing my own thing when she randomly appears looking the same, doing the exact same thing. I've never approached her and she's never approached me. We've never even made eye contact before. I'll just notice her in the corner of my eye and maybe stare for a bit, but she looks to be too in her own world to notice. I haven't seen her in a while now, though. I'll be 18 this year, and I think the last time I saw her was around five to six years ago. But I am curious what this even meant, or if something similar has ever happened to anyone else out there. What are your thoughts? My old house, two houses ago. My husband is in the military and leaves for weeks or months at a time. He was TDY, had been gone for about three weeks at the time, and I tucked our girls in and went to bed. I read for a bit, made sure the girls were asleep, and then got back into bed. I pulled the blanket up and snuggled in and felt my husband crawl into bed next to me and hug me like one of those hugs that are filled with love, protection, and just... They're the best kind of hugs when in bed. I felt so safe, so warm and loved, and I sort of wallowed in the hug for a moment, until it hit me that no one was in the room with me. I didn't get freaked out, though, because it was so not a scary happening. Another thing that would happen there was seeing a little girl in a white frilly dress out of the corner of my eyes, only when hubby was gone though, never when he was home. The girls had instances as well. They both played with the little girl, but neither told each other about it or my husband and I. Not until years later, and my youngest asked about the blonde girl we had that always wore white dresses. She was three, four, and five when at this house. And my oldest was all, yeah, what was her name? She'd play before bedtime a lot and then would go home. Then we moved from the house. I had left my pillow there and ran back to get it. I went upstairs, grabbed it, and then stopped on the landing of the stairs and just stood a moment. And then said, bye house, because you could feel it there. And seconds later, I felt like something wanted to push me down the stairs, so I booked it out of there. I didn't say anything to anyone because I figured I was just going crazy. My husband went a week later to take all the final garbage out and stopped on the landing as well and looked around and did the same thing and said, Bye, you were such a great house. And he felt like he was going to get pushed down the stairs. Only he flew home and told me. Didn't care if he was seen as crazy or not. That's when we started talking about the weird stuff that would happen, but never connected it to being haunted. Other little things. Going in the basement at night. We'd be overcome with a feeling of utter dread, and we took to doing laundry during the day. The cats would stare at spots that had nothing in them and puff for no reason. 
Overall, it was not a bad house. We left it there, but moved due to horrible neighbors that ugged up the neighborhood to the point we couldn't stay. Parties every night, loud fights, etc. No thank you. Finally, a time to tell these stories. I'll go through the little stuff leading up to a couple of major events that happened in my house. So, for backstory, I live in a house I grew up in and inherited. My grandfather died upstairs in one of the two bedrooms up there, in what is now a glamour room when I was somewhere around eight years old. I remember being very afraid of him. Then... About four years ago, I found my dad passed away after doing a wellness check on him downstairs in the dining room. That was when I completely renovated the house with the intent to sell. But after seeing it with a nice new facelift, couldn't let it go and decided to move in. So, activity information. I noticed spikes of activity, I'm going to call it. I've never been a believer in spirits or ghosts of any sort. I rely on facts and science to prove things, but some of this stuff along with the major events have me stumped. And now, I've just had to settle on the thought that energy from my father has gotten trapped in a loop downstairs and upstairs. I'm still unsure of. But I do believe the activity relating to upstairs versus downstairs are different and come from the deaths of the people who died on that story of the house. So anyway, these spikes of activity, I noticed things happen gradually with an increase in severity, starting small and then becoming a major activity event. Over the course of a three months-ish, and then... Everything goes away for about six months. The major activity event, which usually is, I've noticed, the end of a string of building up events, have caused me to reach out to people to do a ghost hunter-esque type thing on the house. But by the time I hear back from them, I notice everything stops. So I leave it alone. We are currently in an active phase, but anyway... Let me explain the different events now. So, small activity examples. One very common small thing is I will be cooking in the kitchen next to the dining room, and I'll sit down mixing bowls or like a ladle, usually one of those two things, and I'll turn around to prep meat on the other counter, and when I turn back to grab it, it's gone. This makes me feel insane, and I have spent around an hour searching the entire house and all the cabinets in the drawers for it, before turning around again, finally being like, well, never mind, I don't know where it went, and going back to cooking, and then it's back in its original position. The small event made me check my carbon monoxide detector. Another one is sounds of static while talking, like a walkie-talkie from behind my headboard. The wall is against the dining room where my dad died, and both me and my ex-husband heard it while we were laying down to sleep with everything off. I know my father died with the stereo on with music playing, which he kept in the dining room against the wall my headboard is on. I researched things and read some crazy shit about how an overhead fan turned on and pick up radio signals, and I chalked it up to be just that. Another one recently has been my TV turning on by itself at around 2 or 3 a.m. and waking up me and my current fiancé. The volume is always turned to the max at 100 when this happens, and it scares us awake. We do not watch TV at that volume. This has happened two or three nights now. It's a new event. We also have our living room lights. There are two that are built in to a very, very high ceiling that turn on both with one switch. And lately, when we are watching TV and turn them off, one will turn on by itself. Only when we are sitting there, though. 
This has never happened when we turn off the lights to go to bed, but it will repeatedly happen while we are sitting there. I've had an electrician come out to check for a short and check the wiring, and he found nothing wrong. Footsteps, running, and walking upstairs. These go from our loft to the glamour room only, and it's a very obvious sound. Those are the rooms my grandfather would be in. This will be very relevant for a major activity event discussed in a bit. Another thing upstairs is when I am in the glamour room, I constantly hear a bone vibrating, like it's ringing, and then it just will stop. There is a door to the attic from that closet that also connects to the garage, but I've checked it for phones. But any phone up there would have died. I do keep my dad's ashes and cell phone in that closet, but his phone long died and does not even turn on. Major activity event. I can really pull only two things that I would consider major events, and after these have happened, activity has disappeared for months. The first that happened was about six months after I moved in and the disappearing kitchen shit started. Then, the next week or so, was the radio walkie-talkie sounding thing from behind the headboard. About three months after that, my now ex-husband and I were laying in bed and trying to go to sleep. Something pounded on the kitchen sliding glass door. Three large bangs. We both shot up in bed and grabbed a baseball bat. We do not keep guns, by the way. And went to go look. It sounded like someone was trying to break in or break the glass. We have ring cameras installed around the entire house that alert us to any and all activity, and we checked those, and there was no motion in the backyard, and you could clearly see the patio door when the sound occurred. There was nothing there. When we investigated the door, there was a handprint from like, mmm, like if you press your face up against the glass and your breath fogs it up and it leaves an imprint, I took a picture and we spoke about calling the police, but didn't due to the fact that no one was there. So we went to bed and the next day investigated how the noise had happened. I had him pound on the door the same way from the outside, open-handed and close-handed. Then the same from inside. The sounds were completely different and we both immediately could hear. The sound was a flat open hand, but came from inside. I could only come up with maybe the energy trapped from my dad's last day or routine or something as what all of that was. I still don't know. Ugh. The next major event was about six months later after a string of smaller activities. Things mostly the footsteps and upstairs stuff, like the phone vibrating. One night at around 2 a.m., I was woken up to what sounded like running around upstairs. My son was two or three at the time, and his room was across from my glamour room. So I got up in full mom mode, ready to go catch his little butt and put him back in bed. I go upstairs and open his door. He sound asleep. So I freaked out a bit and decided to slowly turn around and open the glamour room door. I will never forget this as long as I live. When I opened the door, everything was dark from the lights being off. But the closet for that room is directly across from the entrance door. And I swear on my life, there was a little red light like from a recording camera, and I heard a phone notification go off, like the old school Jurassic Park phone notification. I slammed that door shut, grabbed my son, woke my ex-husband, and have him investigate. There was no one. At this point, I am convinced we have a squatter in our attic, so I have my ex-husband drill the freaking access door shut to the attic. 
The next day, we investigate, and there's no one in there, nor signs of anyone. It would set off our ring cameras to access the garage if they broke in and got up there. But once I drilled that door shut, it all stopped. All the phone vibrating up there, along with footsteps. So, there it all is. Like I said, I have contacted ghost hunter types, but the activity will go away. I'll answer questions and I'd have the other people's theories because, like I said, I don't believe in ghosts and I'm looking for some type of explanation for these things. So, for context, my sweet little grandparents are essentially my parents. Raised me most of my life and gave me everything. God bless them. My family is fairly international, and my grandparents would often take trips out of the U.S. to go visit various family members. I would go with them often when I was younger, but as I got older and they retired, they would occasionally go on trips without me while I was still in high school. On this occasion, they had left me to go to the UK for two weeks. I was 17 at the time, and they deemed me old enough to stay at home for the last week of school and the first week of summer vacation. We lived in a nice house in the more suburban area of our city, in a gated community. The neighbors knew I would be alone and thus had emergency keys to our place as well as being on call if I should need anything. Our house had an alarm system, which was great at first and did help us to feel very safe and secure as we slept or if we were away. Before they left, the alarm had been set off a few times in the night, but it was not only for the doors, but the windows as well. And I believe it even had motion detection for the living room and kitchen areas, as none of us tended to wander into those areas at night when the alarm was set. The few times it went off, we couldn't tell what had tripped it and concluded that maybe a bird had knocked into the window and set it off. None of us were particularly concerned about it. Anyways... My grandparents left for their trip, and per the usual, when they were gone, I would sleep in their bedroom, as it was closer to the alarm pad. Had a phone in their room for emergencies, and was also closer to the laundry room, where we tucked our two little pups in to sleep every night. It just made me feel more secure, since I was still a little weary of being alone at night. The second night I was alone... The alarm tripped at about 2 a.m. It wasn't a school night, so I was up watching TV. And when it went off, nothing sounded like it had been broken or opened, and the dogs weren't barking at all. So I stayed on the phone with the alarm company while I checked everything out. It was also a freakishly loud alarm. So the husband of one of my neighbors ran over and cleared the house with me. We concluded another bird had hit the window somewhere, so even though nothing was found, I reluctantly went back to bed and slept without incident. A week passed with no further issues. I had friends over the next Friday, a few days before my grandparents were set to return. We swam, indulged in a little wine, big bad rule breakers over here, and played rock band till the wee hours of the morning. I saw everyone off, cleaned the house until about 3 a.m., and then passed out in bed. It should be noted that I slept with the bedroom door locked, and all the light, except for the foyer and entryway light, were turned off. I woke in a panic at about 4.30 a.m. to the alarm going off, and the dogs going absolutely bonkers behind the laundry room door. Most disturbingly, one of the lights in the master bathroom was turned on. I had had a single glass of wine, and I know I hadn't woke up to use the bathroom because I noticed just how badly I had to pee when this was all happening. 
It was odd, too, because the specific light that had come on was one we rarely used. It lit up the big jacuzzi tub in the corner of the master bathroom and, different from all the rest of the normal-sized light switches on the panel, it was a small sideways switch underneath the rest. The alarm company called me. I was terrified this time, so I grabbed the phone and hid under the bed. They asked if I was okay, and then relayed that the motion detectors in the living room were going off. Someone was inside the house. It seemed like hours went by, though it was merely minutes before I heard my neighbor unlocking the front door. He came in and found me and cleared the house with me. No one was inside, and no one would have been able to get out while I waited by the front door. The rest of the doors were locked. No windows were open, and nothing had been smashed. He even checked the attic though it had a minimal crawl space and we would have heard the ladder creaking loudly as it had been pulled down and back up, so we knew no one hid up there. I ended up spending the next few nights until my grandparents returned with the neighbors and their kids who I frequently babysat. After that night, I felt the strangest heaviness in that house for weeks. It was oppressive, and even my deepest religious grandparents noted how the feel of the house was just off. I never saw anything, never heard noises after that. But the house felt dark and heavy for weeks. To this day, the thought of all of that still freaks me out. Eventually, the house seemed to return to normal, but I never felt comfortable alone there after dark ever again. I still wonder what was in the house with me all those nights when I was all alone. Okay, so about 21-ish years ago, my mother was able to buy her first house and got it for a really good price. I remember being very excited to have my own bedroom and every day after school, my mother would bring me to our new house while her and my grandmother cleaned up the place. And since I was there, I was able to pick my own room. The room I had chosen had an old Cheerio cabinet with an old creepy doll, an old music box, and a few other broken tools. I asked my mom if I could keep the music box and started to play with it while my mother cleaned. Eventually, my grandmother found an old beaten-up journal, and my mother and her started to read it. I'll never forget the two entries. Entry number one. Why did she make me do this? She knows how I get. Why couldn't she have kept her mouth shut? Entry number two. I miss her every day. I don't think I can go on without her anymore. I only heard these because I had eavesdropped on my mother and grandmother. They decided to get rid of the journal because of how creepy it was. But we eventually moved it, and that's when the weirdness started to happen. My family were convinced the house might be haunted, but nothing directly was happening until they did. Encounter number one. I was watching TV the pilot episode of Ned's Declassified School Survival Guide, by the way, when something strange started to happen on my TV volume and went super high, my remote stopped working. My brother and stepdad ran in and the channel started to change as the volume got louder. My stepdad said something about it being a deaf ghost when the volume went to mute, followed by the power going out. My stepdad looked at the breaker box and could find nothing wrong with it. Encounter number two. My brother and his friend were playing on the computer and started to hear strange noises. They went to investigate and heard the sound of a train. We lived very far away from the train stations, like there was no possible way we could have heard them. But then they said that they saw and heard a red-haired girl standing in the living room. 
When they turned their back and turned back around, she was gone. Encounter number three. I was sitting at the dining room table alone. My brother was in his room getting ready for our grandmother to pick us up and take us to her pool club. When I started eating, I felt something odd and my chair leg broke. As I slammed to the ground, I saw a black shadowy figure. My brother and my dog ran towards me and he got freaked out. Again, my stepdad looked over what was wrong and he said it looked like the legs were kicked in. Bad things started to occur. I got extremely sickly and nearly died. But after leaving the house, the bad energy followed. We had misfortune in every house we lived in after that. House number one, black mold. House number two, landlord forgot he promised our house to his in-laws. House number three, electrical issues nearly burning down the place. My brother had realized one of our blankets was in his closet when we had first moved into the Bayport house. He begged my parents to get rid of it. So one night we were at the camping trip. My mother dropped the blanket in the fire. And everything seemed to get better, albeit slowly. But here's the crazy thing. The music box was stolen by my cousin when I was 10, still living in the house at the time. And, well, nothing but bad things started happening to him that eventually led to his death. But here's a few strange notes about that house. Number one, there was a stain on the maroon kitchen walls. It wasn't until I was older did I realize that kind of stain only shows up if she painted over blood. Number two, the previous owner of the house reported his girlfriend as missing, not dead, claimed she had run away, maybe after a fight. Number three, the realtor who sold my mother the house said the girl died in a car accident, but there was a large blood stain on our dining room wall. Number four, there was a crawl space we never could access. We were never really given the key, but if we went into the basement area where the crawl space would logically lead to, there was a door that was sealed away with black electrical tape with pipes built over it. My stepfather and his own father looked it over once and realized the pipes didn't connect to anything. One last weird note. When I was playing while my mother and grandmother were cleaning the house before we moved in, I saw something very strange. A shirtless child chasing a dog. Now, at that time, we didn't have a dog. But a year later, we got my first dog and she had stolen my shirt while I was getting dressed. I chased her and realized as I did, I had seen the exact same thing a year earlier. So, that's my ghostly experience. Good evening. Interestingly, I came across another story from a night auditor about some creepy experiences, and it got me reminiscing. I'm definitely a people person, so it didn't take me long to work my way up the ladder at our hotel. I loved that hotel. It was really old, built in 1967. And despite the shambles it was in when I worked there, it used to be the most happening place in town. The decor was unlike a lot of hotels you see today. Elaborate chandeliers and imported Spanish tiles and a beautiful handmade stained glass skylight. A lot of people were shocked our rooms were only $50 a night but it wasn't long before I realized that something was just off about that place. We had this service hallway that connected our kitchen and storage rooms to all of our conference rooms. 
It was my first day, and I'm taking a tour of the facility with my manager while he shows me around. I noticed how it smelled like a nursing home, like mothballs and death. And it was just unnaturally cold, especially for Louisiana in the spring. The deeper we go down the hallway, I start to actually feel sick. I put it off as my nerves, but whatever it is in that hallway and kitchen scared the shit out of me a couple of weeks later. I was working the 3 to 11 p.m. shift. Around 8 or 9 p.m., I went to find a guest, some silverware in the kitchen. I was still pretty new there, so after searching for the light switch, I give up and use my phone as a flashlight to grab the silverware. That's when I noticed the sound of footsteps. Really fast footsteps. I start to turn around and someone or something ran right past me into the dark, knocking over the stack of dishes on the prep table. Needless to say, I said, <laughs> fuck that silverware and ran the hell out of there. I ended up calling a housekeeper who stayed in the hotel occasionally to grab it out of the kitchen, and she said no one was in there. No one who worked there wanted to go in that hallway. Even the cook would bring her great-granddaughter with her in the morning to keep her company while she got breakfast started. No one knew what exactly was back there. But then again, I guess, we just didn't want to find out. After that experience, I was sufficiently scared, but curious. I had become friends with our elderly breakfast cook, a little old woman, probably in her 70s. We'll call her Mrs. J. She mentioned that she had been working there since the early 1970s. She began telling me stories that made me never look at the hotel the same way again. Here's a few stories she had told me. The owner was a cheap bastard, even when I worked there. He didn't want to purchase actual security cameras for the entire property, so he installed two extra cameras in the lobby, one at each entrance to the lobby and one by the pool area, but placed mock cameras down the halls by the rooms, giving the appearance of security when in all actuality they were just plastic boxes. Anyway... One night, a young lady checked in, stinking drunk, by herself and at one in the morning. She requested a smoking room, which are only located on the back side of the property on the second floor. This area is also one of the many blind spots from our cameras. She goes to her room. No one hears from her the rest of the night until the housekeeper show up in the morning to find the woman in the parking lot, covered in blood and whiskey and bloated. Apparently, after she checked in, she continued her binge on the balcony facing the parking lot. She must have fallen over and bled to death in the parking lot. The horrifying part is that she must have been still alive after the fall because the trail of blood behind her looked like she was trying to crawl for help. And because there were no cameras, the front desk was blissfully unaware. We always had cameras in that wing of the hotel afterwards. Domestic violence cases always came out of that wing. People's tempers just seemed to skyrocket when they stayed in that wing. Another interesting story she told me, and I ended up experiencing... There was a country singer named Charlie Rich who died in one of our suites. Our suites were located inside the actual lobby, facing the front desk. He had a pulmonary embolism while his wife was eating breakfast in our restaurant. Mrs. J was even there when his wife found him dead. Room 208. Ever since, a lot of customers complained of people knocking on their doors at odd hours, but the front desk never saw anyone go up to the room. One customer came running out in the middle of the night. He ran up to my night auditor and told him that there was a man in his room 
Of course, when my N.A. went to investigate, there was no sign of an intruder. A lot of the times when the room would stay vacant for a while, the TV would turn on by itself. I even saw it through the open window. It just turned on. And always to the same channel, CMT Channel 71. Charlie never really bothered the staff. I'd even find myself talking to Charlie on more quiet nights. Sometimes I even played my old country playlist for him. I ended up quitting after working there for five years. The owner was doing some sketchy shit with my paycheck, so I said my farewell to the place. I had grown so much to love. Not even a year after I left, the owner suddenly shut down the hotel. Not sure why, but all the other employees there told to not come back the next day, or ever. They left everything in there. All the papers, computers, furniture, food, all left inside the massive, vacant, blood-red building. I grew up in a century house. I think it was 105 years old in 1985, so very, very old. It was beautiful, but I hated the vibes there. Felt nasty and unclean. Between the ages of three and eight years of age, I would see a fuzzy, misty apparition that would play peekaboo with me in the mornings as I lay in bed. At first, it would be misty and become more intermittently, more solid, waxing and waning in its invisibility, like power surges. For a long time, I would stare, especially on weekends when I slept in and had time to ponder, thinking I was half asleep, but I would count, spell words, do my ABCs, later recite prime numbers, pinch myself, move about to make sure I was awake, and I always was. I am pretty straightforward, always have been. I could not believe my eyes, but then I got used to it, and I would just keep playing peekaboo as I read my books and magazines, went and got some cereal, sometimes take a bath and come back and read, and later, when I got a TV... I watched cartoons. It was my morning ghost buddy. I did my thing and it did its thing. It was a misty shape of a head and shoulder and featureless, but semi-solid. I could see through it, but also it was like static and would sometimes be more obvious than fade back to a less solid fog. Also, like moving particles, if you stared long enough, like static from a TV, but more white. It did not feel scary, just odd. It was almost like I was witnessing something highly unusual and it was becoming bemusing. A phenomena of sorts. Anyway, the freakiest part is that it was doing the peekaboo thing at the top corner of a 10-foot door frame. Sometimes a little more than the head and shoulders would move out, and it would be an amorphous blob. It's like there was a barrier, and it could not move far beyond the doorframe. I don't even know if it was actually truly conscious enough to be playing with me, or if it was sort of stuck there at the frame doing its thing, but I sort of felt it had some intention, just a feeling I had. Eventually, it would stop or the light got too bright. It was not discernible, but I think it stopped about mid-morning. Never saw it at night or dusk or any time during the day if I took a nap. This was only in the morning hours between dawn and say about 10 or 11 a.m. Eventually, I just stopped seeing it. Could be because I started closing my bedroom door at night as I got older and wanted privacy. Looking at the history of the house that was built by a distant relative who owned a sawmill and local hotel, 
He had a bad actor from what I understand. At some point, there was a fire shortly after the house was first erected in the 1880s and the stairwell and upper floor were damaged and reconstructed. Not a devastating fire that killed anyone, but the stairwell and foyer on the second floor by my bedroom was not the original part, but 20 years or so younger. I don't know. Maybe he killed somebody there because he was a southern gangster of sorts and was involved in getting rid of some folks, or so it said. Some people did pass away at the house of old age and natural causes, Wakes were held there, so maybe a ghost? Appalachia is old with history predating these settlers, so who knows? So, to my knowledge, no dramatic deaths and my family were all about knowing the scoop on the family drama. Also, the house eventually burned down due to electrical issues during renovations after we sold it in the 90s. It had a majorly creepy vibe in some of the rooms also, like a feeling of dread and sadness. I had a playroom in the attic, and sometimes I would be playing and feel like I was being watched, and the hair on my arms would actually stand up, like fear or static in the air, and my ears would start to ring. I describe it like the air change, like when you go to a higher altitude and your ears pop, or when the silence becomes audible, a shift in silence from normal silence to complete and thick silent. It was a total atmospheric shift, a pressure change, if you will. I would be so afraid I would almost get a freeze response, but somehow knew not to react. Like I was scared, but to put my things away per usual and calmly leave like normal without freaking out or getting hurried. As I got older, I have heard some bad energies feed on fear. So, it's interesting as a kid, I knew in my gut not to react. Remove myself, but not react. I have always had a good poker face, and maybe that's why. I also don't scare easily, even in situations that would warrant panic. I'll freak out later, but in this moment, stay cool. Like autopilot or going numb, which is good news when you need your wits. That's the first time I remember engaging that mode, about five or six years old, in my attic playroom. Another story. We lived in mountainous area foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains. At the base of the mountain, there was a huge cotton field. It was beautiful, actually. But I would freak the hell out when I saw it. My mom said it started as a toddler. I would look at the field as we drove by, and I would start hyperventilating, whimpering, and get tearful. Later, when I got older, at around five, and learned what was up, I would just hide under a blanket until we passed it to manage my exposure. As I got even older, I would just look at it and try to figure out what about it vexed me. It was a stunning visage, beautiful and picturesque. Nothing happened there like a battle or recent bad history, but my mind saw something my mind could not, and it was freaky and I hated it. As an adult, I no longer get that feeling at all when I see the field. Just a peaceful place. People even take pictures in the late summer and fall when the cotton blooms. Also, there's a sunflower field adjacent to it that's glorious. It's a sunny patch in the middle of the mountains, a valley with meadows and coming off the mountain. You get a bird's eye view and it's like no other. But as a kid, I wanted to walk a wide circle around it. And I do mean a wide circle. As I'm sure some of you are aware, 
the hunting season for white-tailed deer is about to start this weekend. I've been spending a decent chunk of time in a stand with my partner, in life and in most adventures generally, because we've discovered the hogs have been rooting up the oats and generally causing havoc and scaring away the deer from the feeder. We've gone out a handful of times in the last two weeks to catch the miscreants at it. So far, no luck. Just very frustrating. At any rate, because of the hogs, I've been spending more time in a stand after dark than I have ever in my life. We've been up there from 9 p.m. to 1 a.m., 10 p.m. to 2 a.m., 9 p.m. to 11 p.m., and every other weird time slot you can think of. I mention this just in case it's relevant or helps paint a picture. There have been a few things that have happened that I struggled to explain away or rationalize, and my partner's out of ideas too. The first thing happened about a week and a half or two ago. It was around one or two in the morning, with a decent chunk of moon illuminating the area. I was only half paying attention to my surroundings because I'd already written the night off as a bus pretty much, when all of a sudden I became aware of a weird whirring or flapping sound. I thought it originated from somewhat behind me, but my partner said he heard it coming from away and to the front left of us. At any rate, it was loud, airborne, and passed quickly over us and away. I am very familiar with the sound that a drone makes, and this wasn't it. It also wasn't a chopper. The sound was too small, if that makes sense. And it wasn't a bird. It sounded too mechanical. It was flying very low, probably just above the tree line. We couldn't see anything. The second thing happened about a week ago. We weren't in the sand, but it was weird and out of the norm, so I'll mention it. We live on the same property that the stand is on. It was around 9 or 10 at night, when all of a sudden there was a distant boom, like an explosion which hit our home, like a thud. If you've ever spent any time around heavy artillery or explosives, you'll know exactly what I mean. It was strong enough that my sister-in-law, who lives down the road, called us asking what the hell had just happened. It could have been a natural gas explosion, but the weird part is that my partner did some internet digging and a local emergency management website had posted asking for any information on an unknown explosion back in 2016, during the same time of year. We still have no clue what it was. And then lastly, tonight, we were out in the stand once again. It had gotten cold, and we've had a ton of rain all day. So everything was damp and dripping. We went out at 10, and it was about 10.30. I was preoccupied with something to keep my fingers and toes warm, when suddenly I became aware of a weird murmuring. My partner heard it too, but he has hearing damage, so I don't think he heard the full breath of the tones. To me, it kind of sounded like... Mm, muffled voices off in the distance, like several someone's having a conversation too far off to make out the individual's words. But the direction the sounds were coming from doesn't have any buildings or dwellings. It's just woods. And there were several different tones. My partner said it kind of sounded like a cow moaning but not quite. There are cattle in the area, and we hear them vocalizing all the time. This wasn't that, and there isn't any grazing land in the vicinity of the sound origins. They carried on for maybe 30 seconds, slightly rose in a crescendo, and then died off 
and faded away completely. I want to stress how indistinct these sounds were. If I hadn't been listening intently, I don't know if I would have heard them at all. All of this, coupled with the general gut feeling I have whenever I'm out in the dark alone, has me wondering. I don't necessarily feel endangered, just generally watched and noticed. I have very good instincts, and I try to listen to them. I love to know what you all think. There may be rational explanations for all of these phenomenon. All I know is, I don't want to be another hunter with another creepy story. But I feel like I'm starting to see a bell curve emerge. Thank you for listening to my story. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true disturbing ghost stories. Before I go any further, I would like to acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes. Chrissy Elias, Anita V, Donna, Luz Crispin, Samantha Place, Coleman Carter, Corpse Lover, Stephanie McLaren, Denise S, Tina Mee, Tammy Slayton, Jova Khaleesi, Ada Smith, Amy Klimko, and Haunted. Once again, thank you all so much for being the pillars of this channel. I can't express my gratitude enough. To the subscribers and the random listeners, or if you're just peeking in for the first time, thank you so much for supporting Back to Ashes. My heart goes out to everyone, because without you, there would not be a me. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves and stay safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.